Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to Morning Star Fellowship. Happy Easter 2021. I was thinking about this. Uh, last year at this time was when we originally tried to plan to open this campus. How many of you saw the, the, the banner out there? First of all, it was a complete lie uh, because first it said 2019 and that was, we way overshot there. We, we had some lofty goals. We didn't realize we were nowhere close to that. And then we were, we were ready for Easter and we were about a month out. We're ready to open, a lot, some finishing touches and then Obviously there was other plans there, COVID hit, things changed, but it's been really awesome to see what God has done since we've opened here in September. And we're so excited. If you're here for the first time with us, man, you are our honored guest. Please stop out there, grab a free gift. Even if you don't fill out the card, we don't really care. We just wanna thank you for being here with us today. Join us again next week. We'll be here at nine and 11 going forward. And, and we are really, really, really excited for what God is doing here. As the video said, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors on staff here and uh, I have the privilege of helping oversee this campus and. Uh, sharing God's word with you today. And I'm excited to be able to do that. We're in the middle of a series called Jesus Is. If you haven't been here, what we've been doing throughout this series is we've been looking at some of the events leading up to and through Easter. And we are looking at what Jesus revealed about himself, what he said about himself, what did he teach about himself through these events? And not only what did he teach then, but what does he wanna be now? Who does he wanna be in our lives today? And what we're talking about today, Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the empty tomb we're talking about Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. As Jesus was sacrificing his life on the cross, we talked about this a few days ago on Friday night, uh, he spoke seven different phrases on the cross. Now we're not gonna get into all of these different phrases, but I wanna mention the last one that was spoken because I believe these words that Jesus spoke on the cross, some of these last words were some of the most significant, life-changing words in, in human history. In John chapter 19, it says it like this. It says in verse 28, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This phrase, it is finished, comes from this Greek word, and I'm probably gonna butcher it, but that's okay. It's uh, tetelestai. Okay, if you know Greek and I messed it up, don't judge me. I'm not gonna sit up here and pretend I know Greek. I don't know Greek. Some of you might've been impressed for a second. I don't, I, like, I don't know Greek. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I tried Spanish in high school. Uh, I didn't do very well. I remember, the one thing I remember about Spanish is I knew how to say, where is the bathroom? And I knew that my name in class was Zorro. That's all I remember <laughs> about Spanish class. And so I don't know Greek, but I do know how to use Google. And, uh, which is basically the same as knowing Greek. And so I, I looked it up, what this means. And this phrase, it is finished, this phrase, this Greek phrase, essentially means the job is complete. Like if this was a servant, it would say, the work that I've been set to do is done. If this was a priest giving their, doing their job, it would be the offering has been given. If it was a justice, a, a judge, it would be justice has been served. And probably the closest explanation of what this phrase really means is an accounting phrase. And it means the debt has been paid in full. Like that's what this phrase really means. When Jesus spoke these words, he was saying with his final breath, the job that I came here to do, I have done. The, the, the debt that I've come here to take care of and to pay, I have paid in full. And he breathed his last breath and gave up his spirit. The Bible says when that happened, there was an earthquake in Jerusalem. And when that earthquake happened, there was a, a veil in the temple. This veil was a 60 foot tall, as wide as the palm of your hand. It was not just a little piece of fabric. This was a, a large veil of fabric that stood between the, the most holy of places, keeping people out. Only once a year did the high priest go beyond that to make sacrifices and atonement for the people. It was a sacred place. And the Bible says when that earthquake happened, that veil was torn in two from top to bottom, it was as if God was saying, as Jesus made this atoning sacrifice, the thing that separated you from God's presence, the thing that kept you from having a relationship with God has been torn. And it was Jesus and God that did the tearing of it. We talked on Friday night about the spiritual realities of the cross, what the cross accomplished for you and I if we are in Christ. It wasn't just the physical realities, but the spiritual realities of the cross. But can I just say this this morning, if the cross was the end of the story, like if the story ended at the cross and death was the end of the story, can we agree that that would have been a bad ending? 
Can we agree that that wouldn't have necessarily been a happy ending? Can we agree that that's not, that's not necessarily a great, like that's, that's not a great ending, but we know that that was not the end of the story. See, after he died, the Bible says his body was taken down and it was quickly prepared for burial because it was the Sabbath and they put Jesus in a borrowed tomb. It wasn't made for him. They put him in this borrowed tomb and the, the Jewish leaders were so terrified by Jesus. They were so threatened by what he said and what he preached that they put a large stone in front of this tomb, a, a stone that couldn't be moved by one person. It had to be moved by multiple people. And they ordered guards to stand watch 24 hours a day guarding the tomb. Come on, how many of you know that's not normal protocol? Like you don't normally have to guard somebody that's dead. They're dead. Not only that, but they asked the Roman officers to put the seal of Rome on the, on the stone, essentially saying if that seal was broken, that somebody had broken the law of the Romans. Like they had, so, so if, if something was gonna happen in this, because they were scared that Jesus was actually gonna do what he promised to do, or they were scared that his disciples were gonna come take the body. So they were trying to do everything possible to keep this from happening. But can I tell you something? Nothing can stop God's plans. Nothing can stop what God sets out to do. God is unstoppable and Jesus is victorious. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, while we celebrate Easter, verse one through six, it says, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid. He says, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Now come and see where his body was lying. You see the cross, the cross did not have the final word. The, the death of Jesus was not the end of the story, it was just an intermission. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the heart of Christianity. Can I tell you something? Everything in our faith rises and falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything. In fact, Paul, he said it really bluntly in 1 Corinthians. He said, our faith is meaningless outside of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In other words, you're still dead in your sins. It didn't accomplish anything if he didn't overcome death. And if your hope in Christ is only for this life, we're more, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world if the resurrection didn't happen. See, the resurrection, it changes everything. Can I tell you that the resurrection of Jesus, it's not just biblical fact, it's historical fact. The whole city of Jerusalem, the whole Roman empire, they knew what had happened. If CNN was around then, they would have been covering it. If Snopes was around, they probably would have called it fake news because that's what they do. <laughs> Listen, it would have been like all over the place. There would have been a mass search for the body. This was a revolutionary thing that had happened. It would have been everywhere. We know it's true. The, the, the disciples of Jesus, right? All of them, except for one, gave their life proclaiming this message. Can I tell you something? You don't willingly lay down your life for a lie. I mean, when they're about to kill you, if you're lying about it, you're gonna say, all right, I was just kidding. I was kidding, don't kill me. Like that, that looks, like the torture that some of these guys went through to, to share the message of the kids. But when somebody overcomes death, you just really can't keep silent anymore about that message. Can I tell you something? He was seen by many, many people. In fact, we have 15 or so historical references to Jesus meeting people, touching people, talking with people. One time he cooked breakfast for some people. There was a time that he met with 500 people at a time. There's probably about 220 people in here. Imagine a crowd double this size. Jesus appears to 500 people he appears to at one time, proclaiming that he has overcome death. You could search and search and search for a body, but you will never find it because he's alive. He overcame the death. He conquered the grave and he is victorious. But guess what? What does that mean for us? Like, what does that mean for us now? Over 2,000 years later, what does that mean for us? How does the resurrection of Jesus Christ impact and change our lives? That's what I wanna share with you this morning. I really wanna just share two things that we can see in scripture, two things today that the resurrection reveals to us and the resurrection does for us and changes us. The first thing is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The resurrection proves that he is who he claimed to be. Can I tell you what Jesus claimed to be? He, he didn't just claim to be a good teacher. 
He didn't claim to be a prophet. He didn't claim to just be a healer or a religious leader. He didn't do those things. He claimed to be the son of God. He literally said, I am the son of God. He literally claimed when, this, when saying, I am the son of God, that he was on the same playing field, equal with God the Father. Let me ask you something about God. Who alone has the ability to forgive sins? God does. Who alone has the ability to, to bring somebody back from the dead? God does. Who alone has the ability to, to, to give eternal life? Only God has the ability to do those things. And guess what? Jesus did all of those things. He healed people, he raised the dead, he forgave sins all the time, claiming and proclaiming that he is the son of God. So either Jesus was a lunatic, a crazy person, or a liar, or he is actually who he said he is. I've heard people say before, well, I don't, I don't believe Jesus was God. I just believe Jesus was a, was a really good teacher, a really good moral leader, we really taught some really good things, like there's some good lessons in the Bible about how we should live and how we should treat people. And can I just say this? Good people don't call themselves God, right? Like if I was up here and you'd be like, man, Ryan, you're, you're, you're a gifted communicator at times. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm God. That's when you leave, right? Like that's when this becomes a cult. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Like that's, 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 that's the moment you leave. The moment somebody declares they're God, the moment somebody says that, they're no longer a good moral person. They're either who they say they are or they're crazy and you get away from them. So just think about some of the things that Jesus claimed about himself. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. John 14, six, Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We agree that these are some strong, bold claims. Jesus didn't say, I am one way. I am one of many ways to get to God. He said, I am the way. There is no other way. He says, I am the truth. We live in a, a world that's like, I'm just speaking my truth. Your truth doesn't matter. Your truth isn't real unless it's God's truth. Because there is not many truths. There is one truth, and his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Any life outside of God is not real life. It's counterfeit. That's what Jesus proclaimed. That's what he said. He's not a good person. He is God. Only God can make these claims. Only God can claim to have the power of life and death. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he said he was. It proves that he had the power he claimed to have. One day, Jesus walked into the temple and he cleared out the money changers because they essentially had turned the temple into a, a flea market. And when he cleared them out, the religious leaders were like, by what authority are you doing this? Who gave you the authority to, to kick these people out of here? Who, who's, who's allowing you to do this? And he says, well, I'm God. So my father, he gave me the ability to do this. I'm like, well, if you're God, prove it. What did Jesus say? He says, all right, I will. You're gonna kill me. And three days later, I'm gonna come back to life. He said, tear down this temple. And three days later, the temple's gonna be rebuilt. He claimed to be God, and his resurrection backs up this claim. John chapter 10, verse 18, he said it like this. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay down my life when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in this room who is able, on call, to end your life and then bring it back? Well, let's look around for a second, anybody? I see, I see no hands. Do you know anybody else who at any point in history could say, you know what, I'm gonna end my life, but don't worry, I have the ability to end it when I want, but also to come back when I want, anybody? I mean, like that's a, a bold claim. That's a, a, like a, a, a completely like bold thing to say in that moment. It's easy to make claims like this. Like I can say, I'm a world record holder in something and if, that you might believe me for a second. Most of you probably wouldn't. Like it's definitely not in lifting weights, right? Like that's, but Jesus claimed something that is completely impossible and he backed it up. No one could keep him in the tombs. The Romans killed him. Can I tell you the Romans? Some people have said, well, Jesus, maybe he wasn't really dead. Maybe, maybe he wasn't really dead and he was just kind of really sleeping. The Romans, they were, they were excellent at their job. They had perfected the act of crucifixion. It was an act that led to death. Always, always. There was never another time where they're like, you know what? You, you withstood a lot. We're gonna let you off the hook. 
Never. It always ended in death. In fact, afterwards, they took a spear and they shoved it into Jesus's side. And the Bible says that blood and water poured out of him. He was completely dead. He was completely, he wasn't in a deep sleep. He was brutally beaten and he was dead on that cross. Nothing could stop him. They took him and put him in a tomb. They sealed the tomb with a heavy stone. They placed guards to the entrance of the tomb 24 hours a day, guarding it, thinking that they could stop it. But they didn't realize that he said, I lay my life down and I can pick it back up when I want to. Can we just agree on something? If somebody, if you know somebody and they claim to be God, and then they claim that they're going to prove that they're God by dying and then three days later coming back from the dead and they actually do it, then that person's worthy to be followed and that worthy to be praised. Can we just agree? If any person in history can do what Jesus said to do, can actually overcome the tomb, can overcome death, can overcome the grave, they actually say they're gonna do it and they actually follow up and do it, that person is worthy to be followed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is good and that he is victorious. And then number two, it shows that Jesus can do what he promised to do. If someone's actually able to overcome death, the great equalizer, like we talked about this on Sunday, on Friday night, every single one of us, every day we breathe, we're just one breath closer to the end. It's kind of a morbid thought, but it's truth. Every single one of us, we're, we're gonna die. That is our, unless Jesus comes back, like every single one of us, we're gonna taste death at some point in our life. We've experienced it with loved ones. It's a reality of life. We can't, uh, we can't get away from it. Jesus did not just die and rise again to die again. He, he died, rose again from the grave, never to taste death again, overcoming death once and for all time. The resurrection shows without a shadow of a death. If Jesus can overcome death, the great equalizer, then there is nothing that he can't do. There's no promise that he's made that he's not able to fulfill. So what does that mean for you? What are some promises that that means for you? Number one, it means that your sins can be forgiven. That's good news. That's the good news of Easter right there. Have you ever been halfway through a project in your life? Like you started something and you were like halfway through and you, and like about halfway in, you were like, I really wish I could start over. Like any home project, I, that's where I don't even start them. I just ask somebody else to do it. <laughs> Cause I know in the middle of it, I'm gonna be like, I shouldn't have done that. I bit off a little more than I can chew. And my father-in-law comes to the church and he could tell you that's true. There's been times in life, right? Where we start something and in life, it feels like that sometimes, man, I really wish I could have a do over. I really wish that I could go back and change that. Come on, how many of you would say that there's things in your life that you have regrets about? There's mistakes that you've made that you wish you could go back and change. There's thoughts that you've thought that you wish you didn't think. There's words that you've said that you wish you didn't say. All of us have made mistakes. The Bible calls those mistakes sins. Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. And because of that sin, we deal with shame and guilt and the need for a, for a do-over, a fresh start. And the resurrection proves that your sins can be forgiven because God said he can forgive your sins. If you're here today and you're still breathing, can I tell you something? We serve a God, not just of second chances, but we serve a God of third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh chances that if you're here today and you're breathing, that God's not done with you. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how many times you've failed, how many things you've messed up. You wish you could have a do-over. You can have a do-over, a fresh start because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, eight through nine, it says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. It says, listen, you're not fooling everybody else because everybody else already knows you're lying. They know you. They know that you sin. Some of you be like, I sinned today. I cursed somebody out in the parking lot. I yelled at my kids in the car because nobody was getting ready. I yelled at my son because he wanted to wear sweatpants. I said, it's Easter. Jesus didn't rise from the dead so you can wear sweatpants next week. You know, we all sin. It says, if you claim you don't, you're a liar and really you're just lying to yourself. But I love what the Bible says here. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our wickedness, all of our unrighteousness. It also says it like this in Ephesians chapter two, verse one through five. It says, once you were dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins. 
You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else, but God. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us new life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For all of us who are in Christ, if you're in here and you are in Christ, you've given your life to Christ, you've trusted him. I'm not saying you prayed a prayer at some point. I'm saying you are in Christ, he is your Lord and Savior. You are following him with your life. This is all of our stories. All of us before Jesus we're dead. All of us before Jesus were not sick. We were literally spiritually dead. There was nothing we could do to change our spiritual condition. But God, but God in his love and his mercy chose to pour out his grace in our lives. Forgive us for our sins. Bring us from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it's by his grace that you and I are saved. Every single person who knows Jesus, that is your story. And if you're in here today and you don't know Jesus, that can be your story because Jesus conquered the grave for you because Jesus paid the price and overcame death. And one of the promises of that that overcoming death that Jesus did for us was that your sins can be forgiven. Your life can be made new. You can be a new creation. You can go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not only that, another promise we see is this. Your life can have new meaning and purpose. Not only can you have your sins forgiven, but your life can have new meaning and new purpose. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said these words. He says, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Another version says, Jesus has come to give you an abundant life, life overflowing how many of you remember when you were kids getting like an Easter bunny for Easter? Like a chocolate Easter bunny. I got one right here. I went to Walmart last night. This is all they had left. <laughs> Can you see this? <laughs> if you can't see it, there's a Easter bunny right here. Uh, I can remember getting these as a kid. Usually you get a bigger one than this. Dollar, all right. And I can remember getting these as a kid and you look at it as a kid and you see this large piece of chocolate. And you're like this is the best day of my life. I know Jesus rose from the dead, but chocolate, like that is, that's awesome. And you get this huge Easter bunny, you're thinking to yourself, man, like I'm gonna spend days and days eating that. This is so awesome. And then you go and take a bite and you're like, the tomb is empty and so is my chocolate. <laughs> like that, that's the reality of the chocolate. That's a disappoint, That's the disappointment of Easter right there. Like that, you, you go to bite it and you're like, man, that, that, is, that is not good news. You know, I could eat that all at one time. I might between services. And you think you, 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 you do that and you see that and you're like, man, this is, this is a bunny that over promised but really under delivered. And I was thinking, sometimes our lives kind of like that. Like outside of Christ, we settle for a light that looks okay on the outside, looks all right, looks pretty satisfying. But the more that we live life apart from Christ, the more we realize that that life is just hollow and empty. And it overpromises. That's what sin does. The Bible doesn't say that sin's not fun. It says that sin is fun for a time, but there's consequences. There's darkness, there's shame, there's things that come with sin that we all experience. And we live and we settle for a hollow life, we settle for an empty life when God wants us to experience a real life, abundant life, a life full of purpose and meaning that's found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's come to give you an abundant life. When you're in, in Christ, the Bible says the same power that conquered the grave The same power that was there that allowed Jesus to conquer death, come back to life, that same power is available to you and to me. That same power that brought Jesus out of the tomb over 2,000 years ago lives in you. He wants to do immeasurably more than you ever hope, dream, or imagine according to his power at work in and through your lives. You don't have to settle for a hollow, uh, empty life that constantly overpromises and underdelivers. You don't have to settle for that type of life because Jesus has come to be the one that fills that void, that, that gives you that life of purpose, that life of, of meaning. 
Some of us be like, I don't, I don't know what the future holds. Like this has been a year where it feels like things are completely out of control, right? It was a year where things felt like completely out of control, but can I tell you something? It was never out of control to God. It was never out of God's control. You may say, I don't, I don't know what the future holds, but can I tell you when you're in Christ, you don't have to, to stress and be anxious about that because you serve the one who knows the future. You serve the one who holds the future in his hands. And the Bible says that he will walk with you through everything you go through. He will strengthen you and comfort you through everything you go to. He will never leave you and forsake you. He felt the, the, the forsaking of, of God on the cross so that you and I would never have to experience that. We don't have to settle for empty and hollow because God wants to give us a life of purpose and new meaning. And then finally, not only can your sins be forgiven and your life have new meaning, but your eternity can be secure as well. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can have hope, not just for this life, not just for this life, but also for all of eternity. The Bible says that our life here is but a breath. We've talked about eternity before. We, we did this rope illustration months ago. We said we, we focus so much attention on, on living for this little part of this rope that represents our life when we are not just you know, bodies with a soul, we're souls with a temporary body. And we focus so much on the here and now and we miss out on the fact that we are created for eternity, that we are created to experience God's presence for eternity, but apart from Christ, we will never experience that. And what we do here is specifically the choice of if we're gonna follow Jesus or not matters for the rest of eternity. And Jesus came and overcame death so that you and I could experience his presence and his goodness for all of eternity. Our eternity can be secure. In 1 Corinthians 15, I wanna read a couple more verses to you. And I wanna look at verse 19 again because it starts by saying that if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In other words, if, if Christ only died for this life, if this is all there is, and we're living our life for him, following him, giving up everything for him, and there's not eternity, and there's not resurrection from the dead, then we should be pitied more than anybody else. But I love what it says next. It says in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given New life will be given eternal life. In John 17, three, Jesus said it like this. He said, this is the way to eternal life. This is the path to eternal life. This is how you experience eternal life. Ready? To know you, the one and only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent. To know, can I tell you this knowledge of God isn't just a head knowledge of God. It's not saying, well, I know God because I read some Bible and I learned about God growing up in church. None of that really matters. It's not a head knowledge. It's a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. To know God, to know him to the point where you believe in him. Not to believe in him like we believe in the Easter bunny, but to believe in him as we believe in the actual true one and true God. To believe and know that he is the one who died in our place for our sins. But death was not the end of the story for him. He overcame death, bringing us eternal victory on the cross. And our eternity can be secure. Really, the Bible says there's only two ways to have a relationship with God. Plan A, you earn it. That's the performance plan. That's the religious plan. Some of you might have grown up in that plan. Essentially, all you have to do, if you wanna get to God on this plan, all you have to do is be perfect. That's all. I mean, it's like from this moment forward, and the rest of your life that you already, you just have to be perfect for your entire life. Perfect, never have a bad thought, never have any bad motives, never say something you shouldn't say, just be perfect. And if you can do that, and you can be perfect and follow God perfectly, then you're good. But can we just agree that that plan stinks? That that plan is horrible and that plan is not gonna work. That plan is impossible. So God gave us another plan and that plan was that you simply trust Jesus to save you. When, you say, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he meant it. I am the only way to God. I am the only truth that you need. And I am the life. No one can experience eternal life apart from Jesus. Can I tell you that this was always the plan? This was always the plan because God knew that we would never get to him on our own. In fact, the law, the rules is not made so that we can get to God on our own. It's made to show us that we can never get to God on our own. 
It's made to, to show us our inadequacy. So it's like, I'm a pretty good person. Well, compared to a murderer, maybe. Compared to God, you kind of stink. <laughs> compared to Jesus, you're not that great. And that's what the good news of Easter is, is that, yeah, you could not get to God on your own. There was nothing you could do. So God put another plan into place where he would live a perfect life in your place. And he would die a brutal death in your place for your sins. He would pay the penalty that you deserved. In Romans chapter eight, verse three and four, it says it like this. I wanna close with this verse. It says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Would you stand with me as we close today? Again, the Bible says Jesus was the only sacrifice for our sins. He lived a, a perfect life, died a brutal death, not for his own sins, not for his own mistakes, but with your sins and my sins on his mind. The Bible says that God is a righteous God. He is a just God and we are not. And our, our sin, it separates us from God. Our sin puts a barrier, puts a, a veil, so to speak, between us and God. And that veil cannot be torn on our own. But can I tell you something? That veil that was torn that first Easter, it couldn't have been done by human hands. It couldn't have happened by human hands. God had to supernaturally tear that veil apart from top to bottom. And God is the only one who can supernaturally tear that veil that separates you from God. That sin that separates you, that those mistakes, those failures that you've made that separate you, God is the only one who can tear down that separation and bring you into a right relationship with God. He's the only way to experience real life. He's the only way to experience eternal life. And Easter shows us that God wants that for your life. That God's desire is that none should perish, but all should experience eternal life. As we close this morning, we're just gonna close with a time of, of worship and celebration to our victorious King. So if you're in here and you're in Christ, this is your story. Can I tell you, like we, we never get past this. Like this is not to the Easter story, this is our entire story. Jesus died and rose again for us. Every single day is Easter Sunday. Every single day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because without it, we have no hope. But God is rich in mercy, forgave our sins through Christ overcoming death for us, proving that he is who he claimed to be and he can do what he claimed to do which means he can forgive your sins. He can give you a life of purpose and he can give you eternity as well. Just let me ask you today as we close, would you just bow your head, close your eyes for just a second. Have you turned to Jesus for that forgiveness of your sins? Maybe you come in here today and there is lots of things that you wish you could have a do-over on. There is many mistakes that you've made, failures that you've failed. Maybe you come in here and you think, I really don't have any hope. I've messed up way too many times. I've gone through all of my chances. That is the good news of Easter. Because if there is breath in your lungs, then God can still change you. God can still forgive you. God can change your life. You can walk in here spiritually dead. You can walk out of here spiritually alive. You can walk in here as an old messed up creation. The Bible says you can leave here as a new creation. And it's not about anything that you do. It's about what Jesus has done in your place. Jesus died in your place for your sins, but death wasn't the end of the story. And death does not need to be the end of your story either. Because we all sin when we're in Adam, but because of Jesus, when we are in him, we can experience eternal life. Is there anybody in here today who would say, today I wanna to say yes to Jesus. 
today, Easter Sunday, 2021, I'm going to know that that was the day that I began to walk in a relationship with God. I surrendered my life to Jesus. I stopped trying to get to God on my own because it was impossible. And I choose to accept what Jesus has done in my place for my sins. I'm going to look around for just a second, but if there's anybody in here today who wants to make that decision today, this is why we exist. This is why we're here today. This is what we celebrate, not only this day, but every day. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I believe today he will forgive your sins. He will give your life purpose and he will also secure your eternity if you will turn to him. Is there anybody in here who would say today, I wanna say yes to Jesus. I just want you to raise your hand really quick. I'm gonna look around for just a second so I know I'm praying with you today. We're just gonna wait for just a second here. If you're making that decision today, I wanna pray with you. And we're gonna close in a time of prayer and worship. So let's pray together. Father, God, we thank you so much for Easter. God, we thank you so much for, for what you did on that cross in our place for our sins. God, I thank you that that cross was not the end of the story, that death could not hold you down that on Sunday we celebrate that you overcame death, conquering the grave for us. And that if we are in you, you will forgive our sins. You will change our lives. You will work in and through us, God. The same power that conquered the grave is available to us. So as followers of Christ today, God, if we are in you, we wanna stop living powerless lives, lives where we just go through the motions and show up here and there. But God, if that resurrection power is in our lives, then our lives should look drastically different than the world that doesn't know you. We were dead in our sins, but thanks be to God. His grace and his mercy changed us. And so today we worship you, God, because you are the only one worthy of our worship and our praise. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray.